Over the years, Rick's delivered countless meaningful and fun presentations, all centered on the, uh, the intrigue and the mystery of the Great Lakes. And it's our pleasure to have him with us tonight. So without further ado, Rick Mixter. Take it away, Rick. Thank you, JJ. I really appreciate it. And to be back with my friends in Monroe, this, this is one of the best turnouts that we get. Um, every year we go to the theater and we pack them in. So it's wonderful to be talking with my, my friends again and to get caught up too. Um, I'm going to switch over so I can show you my screen. And if you guys can't see it, I hope that you will tell me. But here is the share and here is this. And you should see it up full right now. If that is good, then we will, we will talk about what I consider to be one of the big three. There, if you talk about Great Lakes shipwrecks, everybody wants to know, especially with the anniversary on November 10th, uh, just a day ago, um, everybody wants to hear about the Edmund Fitzgerald or two days ago. Um, the other one is the Christmas tree ship, and the third is always our Le Griffon. And it's just a, a famous shipwreck, not so much for really the, the, for the first and final voyage it made, but really because uh, of the searches that have been for it and uh, they've been taking place forever. But if we, if we want to go back and figure out, you know, why the ship is in the Great Lakes, why, you know, why LaSalle was here, we really have to begin with these two superheroes, Father Marquette and Lois uh, Joliet. They were the, both the ones that went down from the, literally down from the Straits of Mackinac and all the way through the river system, following a route that the Native Americans had told them would go all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. And they got as far down as they could, and they described amazing things that Europeans had never heard of, buffalo uh, being one of them. And they got so far down that they thought maybe they'd be incurring into Spanish territory and were really worried for their lives. And they turned around and came back. So this was their journey, May to September of 1673. There were lots of uh, stories made from this, uh, including the big story of the buffalo. And it intrigued a lot of people, especially in France. And uh, this is a, a former priest that was one of those guys, Robert LaSalle. And uh, he was a former priest who decided just to go into business. So he gave up this, his uh, um, vocation and went into... Uh, to be a businessman, if you will, going into Montreal, had some land there, and eventually decided that he was going to try to uh, take advantage of some of that route that was explained by Marquette and Joliet, act actually asking King Louis XIV for rights to uh, the furs that were down there. Buffalo furs brought a very intriguing prospect, and King Louis XIV was not thrilled about him trying to incur on anything on the Great Lakes. That was already spoken for. So his license that he got from the king specifically said it was just to go into the Mississippi River and to bring back those buffalo skins. He was not supposed to do anything. And many of the other fur traders and especially Native Americans were upset that this major boat was now being built uh, for the Great Lakes. He built two of them. One of them, we're not sure of the first name, but many people believe it was called a Frontenac. I've never seen a first person account um, on you know, something that was written to say that was you know, named for the governor of New France. But um, either way, it was um, carrying supplies over Lake Ontario when uh, Luke the pilot ran it aground and destroyed the ship. On board, they had pieces for another boat that they were going to build. And they, they need, the reason they needed to do that was because there's a major obstacle uh, that you might know about, and that's Niagara Falls. You can't sail from Lake Ontario to Lake Erie because of these massive falls. The guy on the inset picture here, uh, very famous uh, a, a priest as well, uh, Hennepin, was uh, the guy that first described Niagara Falls. And when you see his description, you kind of get the hint that uh, Father Hennepin was a little bit of an exaggerator. He said they were 600 feet tall. And uh, so the universe does not afford its parallel in the, in the size of, of the Niagara Falls. I've been there. I'm sure many of you have been there too. Um, <clears throat> they're incredible, but they're not 600 feet by about 500 feet. He was off. Um, and many of his stories after that kind of followed that same kind of parallel that he would exaggerate a little bit. It turns out that when Father Hennepin came over from France, he actually was on the same boat as La Salle. They knew each other, um, and I'm sure they had a lot to talk about. And eventually, um, their, um, their uh, paths would cross again as La Salle started to talk about his own venture. Now, he had been down into 
um, the Ohio River and heard again the legends of the Mississippi. He knew that Father Marquette and Joliet had been down there. So he came back up and said, I'm going to build a vessel, but I'm going to have to build it on the other side of the falls because obviously they, they can't sail it. So if you look at this map in your upper left-hand corner, Niagara Falls, New York, that's where the falls are. And you go over to the right to the big circle, <clears throat> excuse me, and the inset that's in this one um, is a blow up of that as well of Cayuga Island. Now, how do we know that that's where the ship was built? We, we know from the writings that they were about four miles from the falls. That was a, a good you know, point where everybody knew where they were. Um, we know that they hauled the supplies like anchors and stuff like that for that distance. Um, so we're kind of guessing by the description that Hennepin gave about high rising mountains and he called them you know, big hills. Um, that this was probably the river, the Cayuga River as it comes in to where the Niagara River is. And you can tell uh, many of the city fathers in that area uh, agreed because they named the town LaSalle right there as well. And uh, th this is a picture that they actually created um, after Hennepin wrote his story about it. And if you look, they've, they've got massive mountains in the background and this is totally exaggerated. And if you look in the left-hand corner, uh, Palm Tree, which is a surprise for anybody who's been to Buffalo, um, and to the Niagara area, uh, there's no palm trees there, obviously. But uh, this was the, the building of the ship. There were rumors that uh, some of the Seneca Indians were not thrilled about this giant canoe, as they call it, and they were going to burn it. So they accelerated the schedule to get it out there. Um, they finally got it into the water and fired off all of the, uh, the cannons and sang to dam and uh, decided to get underway. So they brought their crew together including LaSalle. This is the area where the, uh, the ship was supposedly built. Um, there's a giant rock. This used to be closer in towards where um, some housing is right on the creek. And uh, it's been moved now to this park area. And uh, it was very interesting to, to kind of be in that area and to really think if this is the area that it was, that this is where this famous vessel was, was built and, and launched in 1679. This is the uh, henchman for the organization. This is uh, Henry de Tonti. And Hen uh, de Tonti was amazing in the fact that, and I'm gonna preface all of my stuff today. If this doesn't become a Hollywood movie, I don't know which of our Great Lakes stories would warrant it more because the cast of characters, the twists in, in this story, um, the danger that happened, the mystery that's involved, this is a true story that should be, and this would be my number one character. Uh, he had his hand blown off by a grenade. In this picture, you see his left hand has a, a, an iron hand on it. So he was known by the Native Americans as the iron hand. And uh, it, it's just incredible to, to uh, think that this guy, he'd be so imposing. Um, and his first job was actually to chase down some people that LaSalle had sent an advance party of about 20 people that would go from Montreal and make their way into the Green Bay, Wisconsin area to get some furs for him. Now you gotta remember, he lost one of his ships. His second ship came in and he borrowed money from his cousin and all kinds of family and, and also um, some of the people, that I think the governor of Front, uh, Frontenac actually had cash into this. So he was way in hock. So he figured he'd hedge his bet and get some furs from the Potawatomi Indians that were all up in the, the Northern Green Bay area. And so he sent an advance crew up there and the majority of them uh, disappeared. They just uh, went AWOL and so he sent Tonti off to actually find them. Let's look at a very early map of the area. This was actually uh, published after the, uh, the journey, but it's amazing to me to think that just through a compass and dead reckoning that they could figure out that we're kind of a mitt. You can see the Michigan, there you can see the, the general outline of Lake Erie and the, the massive long point there. Um, it's pretty cool. So if you look at one in the lower right hand corner, this would be the approximate area where the ship was launched and brought out. And it went around Lake Erie and up into the Detroit River. This is the first sailing vessel to ever go across Lake Erie and Lake Huron. As they went through that um, little tiny lake between the, from the Detroit River that we know now and into the St. Clair River, it was the Feast of St. Clair. So LaSalle actually named Lake St. Clair and the St. Clair River, of, of course, came after that. So he went through there and, and um, had to pull the ship. Remember, the current through there is crazy, uh, like 12 knots at sometimes, 8 to 12 knots. Diving that river, especially into St. Clair, is one of the most frightening dives I've ever done just because of the current that whips through there. Imagine them pulling 
a ship. And that there's no roads alongside to walk on. They're walking the riverbank, pulling their vessel against that current because you can't sail against it. They get finally get into Lake Huron. They go all the way to the tip of the thumb of Michigan and a massive storm hits them. It said that, <clears throat> excuse me, everybody was down on their knees except for Luke the pilot. And everybody was on praying and LaSalle promised God that if he let him get through this storm on Lake Huron, that he would build a temple for uh, or a church for St. Anthony, the patron saint of the, uh, of the sailors. He, he never built that. And this is going to come to haunt him later on. Um, so they make it through the storm. Luke, the pilot, looks at uh, and, and curses LaSalle at that point, saying that, you know, you got me into this. I'm a famous saltwater captain, and uh, you almost get me killed on, on these little great lakes, is kind of how he, how he put it. So they sail up to the Straits, where one of our um, newest uh, um, established forts, or at that time it was probably just a little settlement, and they uh, got new supplies. And then went through the Straits of Mackinac and ended up, and we don't know exactly where, but the islands that are off of Door County, Wisconsin, at the very end of Green Bay, where it empties into uh, Lake Michigan, there's an island chain up there. Many people believe it's Washington Island, which is one of the larger islands that's there. I think it's the largest in that area. Um, but some people also believe it's Big Summer that was there because of the, the they called it in all the earliest uh, travels of Potawatomi. Um, on, island and so we don't know exactly which one it was but for um they went to that place got all those furs and against the king's orders and and all the rules he turned the ship around LaSalle got off and remember Tanti was off too because he got off at uh, um, the the uh, St. Ignis and went up to the Sioux to try to chase down those guys that all went AWOL and they were all going to meet back up um, just in Wisconsin to be able to make their way all the way down to uh, the river system so they could go to the Mississippi, which is eventually where he wanted to go. But as they did, and you look at the journals um, from Hennepin and from LaSalle, there, there are accounts of a massive storm that happened after Griffin took off with Luke the pilot and six others. And it said in the middle of the traverse, amid the most beautiful calm in the world, a storm arose. Now that's very significant because it's like so many of our major storms that have happened at exactly this time period. That, the uh, 11th of November is famous for the Armistice Day storm where hunters were literally frozen because the, uh, the, they were in nice, calm, warm weather like we just had, and it just went snap and became freezing cold. A million turkeys died um, in that storm as well. 1913, same thing, two storm systems that came in on pleasant times and then turned. And the Edmund Fitzgerald is another example. So here it is, calm, a storm arose. We uh, completed the great passage in the darkness of night, calling to one another as not to part company. The water often entered our canoes, and the impetuous wind lasted four days with a fury like the greatest tempest of ocean. We nevertheless reached shore in a sandy bay. Five days that storm blew. So there's no question that Griffin had that storm to contend with, and for five days, there was also talk from Native Americans that had been talking that they saw a large canoe um, white with all kinds of white people on it waving for help that was lost somewhere on the northern part of Lake Michigan. So that was kind of the, the gist of, of what probably happened. But in the, really, LaSalle thought that Luke the pilot had gone AWOL himself, that he took all those furs for himself. All of his earliest writings was that he believed that that they had mutinied him and took the, you know, the griffin and, and then burned it once they got their car you know, cargo of uh, furs that they had on board. Um, he later would hear about the legends and Tanti would come back and tell him too about how, you know, it was likely destroyed in a storm. So here he's now out two ships and he's trying to get down the Mississippi River to go further than Father Marquette and Joliet went. And he did. And here's a, a, a good, uh, I'll get back to his story because it's going to get pertinent as we talk about another shipwreck that you might not have heard of before. But here's a neat shot from 200 miles up. So we're looking from the International Space Station and Washington Island, Big Summer Island. Washington Island is actually um, in Wisconsin. Big Summer is just, uh, uh, in, it's in Michigan. Our islands actually go all the way down to St. Martin and uh, poverty that are in that area too. So there's so many possibilities of where they could have actually loaded those furs. But the first time that I start to see um, newspaper accounts 
of, uh, of them searching for Le Griffin, other than the fact that, you know, LaSalle himself did, um, was a 1912 story when the, the Saginaw River was being dredged out. It was notorious for um, spilling sand in there and making sandbars so boats couldn't come in. So in 1912, there was a story of how they were dredging it out and they found an old vessel and they thought, well, it might be the, the, the Griffin. Now that could have been fed by the fact that in 1910, 1911, there were a couple of really big articles that were done on Hennepin and LaSalle. And th that tends to feed a lot of these stories when you get you know, some newspaper story that comes out and then they find an old vessel, it's fresh in their minds. It instantly becomes, if it's old, it's gotta be Griffin. And it's, it's panned out to be not necessarily the case. And that's true in Manitoulin Island. So if you think about this, there, we're saying in this story, uh, possible, that they left from uh, Green Bay, went all the way through, went through the straits where they were ordered by LaSalle to stop and replenish their supplies so they could make the long journey down across Lake Huron. They, nobody ever saw them. Nobody ever um, took on supplies. There's no record at all that Le Griffin went through the straits, um, which could have happened at night, of course, if they were trying to, to hide away. But our, most of our guesses believe that the wreck is actually in Lake Michigan. But by 1929, 1930, we start getting stories of a very old wreck off of Manitoulin Island in Ontario, Canada. And of course, I have to go up there and see what it's all about. Um, the, it all begins with uh, uh, an ominous story of Skull Cave and how in that, that, that cave, and it doesn't really look much like a cave here, it looks more like an outcropping of a rock, they said that there were six to seven skulls inside there, and one of the skulls was of a giant. Now, I don't know where this came from, where people believe Luke was some kind of a bigger guy. There's nothing that's written, and there's even been a thesis by a very uh, fantastic uh, scholar who uh, wrote in Canada about Luke the pilot, and he, he said there's just absolutely no proof to the fact that they, they found this large skull. The other part is um, they said they found a jar full of uh, accoutrements, so buttons that were from French uniforms and stuff like that. All of this stuff mysteriously vanished. And if you read the papers and the stories, uh, Snyder, who was a very famous journalist from uh, Toronto, wrote several articles, I believe, for the Star. And they were always talking about how the skull was used on a tugboat. I mean, it's kind of morbid to think that that's what they did. But um, that these, they just did not take care of this stuff, which most of them, if you can see the article on the right-hand side, wreckage confirmed as LaSalle's. They did not treat this as being really what it would have been. And that's the most significant find, really European find on the Great Lakes at the time in the 1929, 1930 time period. But this is a story that would persist for 25 to 30 years as being factual. And, that it, you know, and they said that the bones that they found of the ship had burned edges to them and that the pieces were there for a while and it looked like um, copper had been around the whole ship and they, um, the locals had taken lead off of the ship. And I, again, I don't know why lead would have been on board the Griffin, but they were just trying to prove, I think, a point that it was very, very old. If you go to the lighthouse that's at the very end of the, uh, it'd be the far west end of, uh, of Manitoulin Island, they, uh, they have all kinds of bones that are there from a ship. And at one point, this very piece had a sign that said, uh, Bones of Le Griffin, 1679. I think because this is an oil building that's um, opened up and in and, and no way protected, I don't believe that they think that that's true anymore. I think that that was just something maybe as a tourist thing or, or whatever happened after any kind of scrutiny, they realized that it probably wasn't Le Griffin. But there were divers that kept going up there and diving all the time. And, and it caught the attention of one of our early explorers, uh, Eugene McDonald Jr. Uh, was a, a rich guy, um, lots of money because he founded Zenith Corporation. So if you remember the, the TVs, um, and all of it, he was big on the radios back in the, in the early day. So much money that he actually had that yacht that you see in the middle of the screen called the Mizpah. And uh, he would, uh, went up with the Mizpah to Isle Royal and had all kinds of headlines about finding significant things. And finally, he heard about the Le Griffin bones and said, because it was so close to the Columbian Exposition, the World's Fair in Chicago, they thought, he said, I'm going to go get those bones, and because they're significant, the, the hull of the ship, I'm going to raise it up with the Mizpah, with my divers, and we're going to bring it back. And so that's what he did. He went out there to go find it, and of course, it somehow vanished, although he did manage to get all of his headlines, and he did manage to, to bring a, a, a 
good historian with him. George Fox was huge in, in early stories of Native Americans. Um, and I don't know how he got roped into the latter part of it, but I can tell you that I went to Bentley Library in Ann Arbor and looked through his collection and there's nothing mentioned about this trip. So clearly, I don't think he believed that um, that the, the uh, Ms. Pock uh, expedition brought anything new to the story, but they certainly got great newspaper coverage. If you look in the lower bottom of that, that's a picture of this ship. This is Ms. Pock. Um, sadly, Mr. McDonald, or they called him the commander, went through a very nasty and very public divorce in Chicago. Um, and all of his, you know, there was fights over uh, his, his inheritance and even went to a, a mystery in California when his son um, committed suicide. It's a, again, a story that just keeps adding layer after layer. And it, it has a weird coincidence with my life too. And the fact that Ms. Pa was um, taken over by the government during the uh, war, uh, I believe it was World War II, and afterwards was returned, but it was in such bad shape, it, I guess it had hit a hurricane or something happened, that they decided that they would sink it off of Palm Beach, Florida. And it turns out, fast forward to about five years ago, my daughter uh, didn't know it, but she was going to get engaged, uh, went out to Palm Beach and, and uh, her fiance uh, called us up and said, hey, you should come. And of course, knowing that um, I'd let them get married if they all went diving with me, he's a diver, so he's in. <laughs> they said, let's go dive some wrecks. And wouldn't you know it, one of the wrecks that we dove uh, one was built in Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin, one of the patrol craft, very famous World War II, and the other was the Mizpah. So for me to swim down the decks, and this was a very brisk current too, uh, we literally had to jump in the water. My poor daughter was sick from, we had eight foot waves really hitting the dive boat. I think that they should have canceled the dive um, because she was so sick. Uh, the good news is once you jump in the water, the waves go away because you're under them at that point. But it was a great wreck to go see. And then to find out later on the connection to the, uh, to the uh, uh, Griffin is pretty amazing to me. Divers went back in 53, 54, and there's all kinds of headlines about them finding pieces and parts of what they said was a Griffin. There's even talk about them finding a cannon, which is significant because there was at least seven guns on board, uh, at least two big ones and uh, some smaller blunderbusses that were on there. So uh, literally, if there's a cannon, it could be, but of course, it never, no pictures, they never found one, never got a good lock on it, but it intrigued me enough to say, I'm going to hop in my car and drive up there, go into Canada, go all the way through to uh, Manitoulin and drive all the way back the length of the island to take a peek. And sure enough, right off of a little park by the lighthouse, I found a shipwreck down there. And it's only in about 60 feet of water. It's not that deep at all. And it's mostly bones. And there's some evidence that there was a fire on it. I'm not convinced that this is exactly the ship that they were talking about. But the truth is, there was a ship that burned right there. The Burlington burned there. So it's totally possible that what they saw was a more modern ship. Although the pieces and parts that they saw with lead, again, I don't know how true they were. Um, and the location literally, you know, where I don't think the Griffin would have been because it just would not have gone through the straits unnoticed and, uh, and not stopped to reprovision. It's not like there's stores that they could stop off after there. That was the only spot at St. Ignace um, that they could have stopped to uh, get any kind of supplies. So I don't believe that that Griffin is up there. Of course, one story brings another. In 1934, Hessel, Michigan, which if you've been to the UP, it, it's not um, too far from Manitoulin. You would go more towards the west, heading towards the, uh, the Mackinac Bridge. Search Bay right, right here um, is not too far. I, I think it's within 30 miles of the Mackinac Bridge, if I remember correctly. Search Bay being very famous in the 1913 storm is the destination for the uh, Plymouth, which was going up there to get some logs. But I heard about a square shipwreck that was found, and there was all kinds of stories about how the Chamber of Commerce in Hessel wanted this shipwreck so badly. They were driving across the ice, and they said it's so old that um, it's got to be the Griffin, and we're going to bring it up. And I thought, I'll never find this shipwreck until I went to Google Earth and started searching in low water times. You can actually do a history search on Google Earth. And if you look in the lower bottom picture, that is a giant piece of wreckage that's there off of Birch Island. Now, the problem that you have is that Rick and his wife are now in Hessel, Michigan, with no boat. I thought I could kayak out there, and it's way too far. And there was also a forecast for storms 
I said, no way, we can't do that. And so my wife goes, well, what are you going to do? I said, I'm just going to go around the dock and talk somebody into it. She didn't think it could happen. But I walked down to the dock and I started talking about shipwrecks. And this family, the DeBoat from uh, Chesney, uh, heard my voice and said, were you on Channel 12? And that's WJRT, the Flint station. And they were from Chesney. So they knew who I was. They knew about the shipwrecks. And they said, we'll take you out there. And to this day, my wife still can't believe it wasn't a plant that I didn't pretend, you know, make this happen. These folks were so great. Um, but the next morning, we woke up to go out to the wreck. And sure enough, there's lightning in the sky and rumbling. And it was going to get mean. So I said, hey, if it's all right, let's go right now. They wanted to bring some friends out. I said, I'll, if we have time afterwards and the storm doesn't come in, you know, I'll, I'll take them back out and give you a personal tour, but let's, let's go see what we can find. So we went off the coast of the island. It's privately owned. There is a house on there, so you can't just land on the island. Um, we stayed off the coast, and I dove in. Here's the propeller of their boat. And I uh, did a real quick survey, just kind of did some measurements, and sure enough, it's twice as long as the, the Griffin. Not that we ever really believed it was, but I, I wanted to make sure that there was some proof. And look at this giant bolt that was on here, too. Uh, definitely not part of the uh, Griffin's construction. And that square sterns, too, also, it makes it look like it was a barge or some kind of a lumber hauler that was used and then finally just disposed of. Um, that's, it's badly broken, but you know many things in the shallow water up there get ground up by ice and stuff too. So that's expected. The, the things you see, the clams on there, those are zebra mussels. Um, it's a neat little wreck, but it's nothing that you know wouldn't take 10 minutes to see everything and, and go out. But we did get back and uh, believe it or not, we couldn't go back in the afternoon. It got so bad storming that the Mackinac Bridge was shut down. So we actually got to spend a little more time in my beloved UP. That's where I was born and raised and uh, waited till the winds calmed down. And then we finally came back down to lower Michigan. There is another ship that came out around that same time period. Um, somebody found a very old ship off of Tobomori, Ontario, and that's into Georgian Bay. And you can tell in the upper left-hand corner, they thought so confident that they called it Griffin Cove. And there was a, a, a local guy named Ori Vale who swore that this was the wreck. And despite all kinds of uh, measurements and um, and people telling him, no, it's probably something smaller. He finally brought up all the bones and uh, uh, brought them into town where you can actually see them now today. Um, he took this literally to the grave with him, um, that he was the finder of the Griffin, even though a complete thesis came out and said, this was probably a Mackinac boat, which is a very small transportation vessel that was used after the larger canoes, the bateaus and stuff. Um, but a very efficient little boat just couldn't haul a lot of cargo. So that's what they believe it was. So it was significant. But Ori Vale to this day uh, has on his tombstone, this is in uh, Tobomori, discoverer of LaSalle's Griffin. Um, just very, very deep in his convictions that, that that was definitely the wreck. And those bones are no longer in the water. But as I mentioned, they, they're on, I think, temporary display. If you want to talk about conviction, you've got to talk about the, the stories that came out in 2000 through 2005 to 2013, when the French government actually spent archaeologists down to Michigan and dive. And this stake was found in the water, which uh, uh, many people uh, um, were told that it was the bowsprit to the, the, the griffin. And the reason was because it was really old. Most people who instantly saw it, especially the fishermen, said, no, 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 that, that's, a, tent, that's a, a fish net stake or a pound net stake. And they, they're used to, they're pounded into the ground and then the, the nets hang on those pegs and they can, you know, gill net fish. And that they had, I mean, literally thousands of them. In 1890, there was 844 licenses given out um, for these pound nets in northern Lake Michigan alone. So there's thousands of these found in the lakes. And if you look at a pound net stake really closely, um, this is a pound net stake right here. The, the two pieces of wood are joined together and you can see the person cut it away to show how the pegs look. So look at the two pegs that are on this. And let me go backwards. Look at the two pegs here and the notch at the top. I mean, it is identical to a pound net stake. And uh, I thought this was the end of it then. Even the French government basically said, we don't know what it is. You know, it could be a bowsprit. Um, they moved on and uh, I thought, man, that story is finally dead until I turned on the news. And I found out that the, uh, the government, uh, Michigan, had given them the, the piece of wood. I, the archaeologist basically thought, hey, it's a piece of wood. We don't think it's from a shipwreck. If you want it, you can have it. And the next thing we know, it's up in Traverse City getting a CT scan 
um, to figure it out. And of course, I, I don't know if this was just for headlines and I, I hate to point fingers, but the result was this. So I, again, it doesn't show anything. Um, there is two pieces of wood that are joined together here. And one of the big questions I would have, if it really was from the, the Griffin, the very first sailing vessel ever built near Buffalo, why would they ever join two pieces of wood together? They had all the virgin oak that they could find up there. There was no reason to ever, you know, especially a, a, basically a part of the ship that would have a, a sail on it, you wouldn't use something that would be pegged together either. So it didn't make a lot of sense on that story. But you know, uh, the state archeologist of Michigan tells me that, that literally um, th ever since he took the job, this is one of the biggest calls that he gets is uh, uh, how many people have found the Griffin. And I, I'd like Wayne Lasardi to tell you from his own mouth about uh, what, what kind of a, a job this has been for the state underwater archeologist. The shipwreck's been pretty interesting. It's uh, the Griffin, of course, is the oldest Euro European vessel that's thought to be in the upper Great Lakes. Uh, and it's been sought after since the day it sank in the 1600s. And, so there have been many claims of Griffin uh, sightings, and all of them have not come to fruition. Uh, I've been working as a state maritime archaeologist since 2002, and I've gone on 17 Griffins, um, none of, only two of which were actually shipwrecks. The rest were things like net stakes and telephone poles and pole barn fragments and um, rock formations and other things. And so. Uh, it, it remains elusive. It has not yet been found. I say that with all <laughs> authority. Uh, it, will it be found? I don't know. It depends, I guess, on the circumstances of its loss and exactly how it broke up or didn't break up or where it settled, that sort of thing. So obviously, yes, we would like to, to see it. And, and you'd think it would die down after that expedition kind of was told. You know, they, they even asked the government, can we dig around the net stake? And uh, they at first said no, and finally got a permit because they were convinced there was a wreck underneath it. And they dug down around it and found nothing. So nothing has really come out of there. I know that the diver that's put it together, my, I'm happy in the fact that he has brought amazing attention, worldwide attention to the shipwrecks on the Great Lakes. But I'm sad that it, it's being you know, taken to this level because as we'll talk in just a little bit, there is something they could find that would, would conclusively say it's there and, and, and you know, part of it would probably be this. This was a picture that showed up on uh, Grand Rapids News and it, it's clearly Photoshopped. I mean, it, it looks like a, a, a Griffin beak, which would be, you know, kind of set to Hennepin's description that, that they actually put a Griffin on the front of the boat. The, the Griffin was the, the family uh, crest of uh, Governor Frontenac of New France. So uh, Griffin was the name and there was a Griffin carved on the front. Um, this would be perfect, right? Well, it, it's actually two pictures merged together, and uh, the the piece that they said was on the bow wasn't even the bow at all. Here's Wayne. Well, the Frankfurt wreck was identified as the Griffin based on the presence of a figurehead that was supposed to be there that when Photoshop pretty heavily actually looked like a Griffin head. Um, but in reality, the figurehead was actually a, a cluster of zebra mussel, not on the on the stem or on the bow of the ship, but actually on the stern post. And the beak that was coming out of the griffin's face uh, was actually a rudder gudgeon where you would attach the rudder as a big sort of hinge. Um, and the shipwreck was exactly three times too big to be the griffin, and it had steam machinery on board. And though I know the French are quite advanced, I don't think. Um, that they had that type of boiler system and steam propulsion system on the Griffin. Yeah, that would definitely be uh, different to have that. Um, I, I guess it just brings up a great point too, and, and it's that I know it's extra work for the state underwater archaeologists, but it is a very significant, and, and there are lots of people looking, and anybody with a fish finder and a magnetometer, I mean, really, uh, for those cannons that are on the bottom, uh, you, you could get into an area that could be the Griffin. Uh, the problem is that so many people find old things and rather than go to a historian, they go to the news and the news is so excited to share these stories right away that they don't even ask questions. And I think many times they actually figure, well, as long as that person is saying that that's what is true, then it should be okay. 
uh, and it's not. I mean, it, it obviously is not. There should be some real foundation before any kind of a major claim is made like that. And we've seen now from 1929 or really 1912, if you include Saginaw Bay, all the way to the present time, the journalists continually are jumping on these stories before there's really any, any kind of proof at all that these were the ships. So my hope is that you know, future expeditions would actually bring in something that would be proof and, and share it with the government. There's, there's always been this really weird, um, I guess, argument that they talk about the, how the government's gonna take over the site, you know, and, and, and there's, there's some questions on who would own it. It was a, a French ship. It was owned by the king, technically. And so, you know, even though it's in the Great Lakes, uh, many people believe that, that that would be the French, you know, that would be their ship. And in the case of uh, another ship that we'll talk about, LaSalle's, um, his story didn't end with going down the Mississippi, and he eventually found the Gulf of Mexico. And as he saw all these new lands and uh, claimed them, put the flag of France uh, right at the delta of the Mississippi River, and uh, claimed all that area as Louisiana for King Louis XIV. He went back to France, and uh, the king said, let's send you back again, and you can set up a fort there because they knew the Spanish would be trying to get their location too. So, you know, especially with the Spanish being around the, the uh, Florida area. So they came back with four ships and of course all those ships got lost. And LaSalle had to try to figure out, you know, first of all, they're, they're in Texas instead of Mississippi River, you know, in Louisiana. So he's got to figure out how to get back to that Delta and walk. I mean, there's no boats because they wrecked all of their ships two years they kind of wandered in the wilderness and then finally uh, ends up if you see this route right here coming from france all the way down around cuba into where they should have turned and gone into the mississippi delta instead they ended up um, off the coast of texas and that's where a storm sank la belle which was one of the vessels and it was completely loaded with everything that they needed to start up a, a you know a fort so they had um provisions, all kinds of provisions that were on board um, if they could just find the ship. And wouldn't you know it, they actually found it. LaSalle himself was uh, said, you know, what we're going to have to do is, is march from uh, Texas all the way to the Great Lakes. That's where we have, you know, some resources in Montreal that we can get back home. His men said, absolutely not. They made it halfway through Texas. One guy was eaten by, I believe, a crocodile. Another got bit by a snake. And finally, on March 18th, of, eight, of 1687, uh, one of his men shot him in the head and, uh, and, and stripped him down, took all of his accoutrements off of him and um, just really defiled, you know, this, this explorer who by all accounts was a, a, a guy that was very hard to get along with. So it's, it's not a huge surprise. The big surprise to me is that uh, LaSalle had relatives that were on there when they found out he was dead. Um, they knew that they couldn't tell Tonti, which, who was back at the Great Lakes. So these guys eventually make it all the way back to the Great Lakes walking. They find Tonti, and they don't tell him that LaSalle's dead. They just say, you know what, LaSalle told, us to, told you to, to give us some money. We're going to get a boat, and we're going to go back. And not until they got back to France did they start to uh, write accounts of what happened and the fact that Tonti's friend LaSalle was actually dead. So, again, why this isn't a, Hol uh, a Hollywood movie, I have no idea. It's got so many twists and turns. The, the coolest twist and turn, and, and one of the reasons why I'm excited we might find Griffon, is the fact that LaBelle was discovered in the Gulf, and they basically put a big coffer dam or big steel ring around it. They sank it down. They pumped the water out because it was such bad visibility. They couldn't find everything that was there, and they knew right away with a cannon that was there that there was a lot of stuff, and sure enough, they drained all the water out and there was over a million artifacts on board from trading beads for the Native Americans to all the guns we would expect on board and all of the things, a rope even was preserved inside there. Even a French sailor was found in the bow section, a skeleton that uh, University of Michigan actually put a face on. So the story of, of LaBelle gives us courage that there would be stuff left. In fact, the ocean usually destroys wooden wrecks much faster than the Great Lakes. We have uh, stumps in the Great Lakes that are from 10,000 years ago, 8,000 years ago, just you know after the Ice Age. Um, we know that if, if they survive that, 
long in the water, we've carbon dated them, that a, a 300 year old ship probably has a lot to it if it hasn't been pulverized in the surf or in the ice. So this one is pretty incredible. And in fact, it, it uh, had cannons on board. It actually had the maker's mark that said exactly the year, King Louis the 14th and, and the dolphins that were on there too. It was part of his family crest. So we knew exactly that this would be the part. And this is what Le Griffin will give us when we finally find one of those cannons. And because the cannons are very hardy, there's a good chance that even if the ship is buried in the sand, our technology will be able to find something like this. Um, the hope being, of course, that we would find a, a more intact wreck to learn more about it. But with the, the bell, I mean, we actually have a complete, now freeze dried, they brought those pieces up and they brought them into an amazing museum. In fact, if you don't mind, why don't I run out there real fast and uh, I'll show you the museum real quick of what they have and what we're looking for on the uh, on the bell. Come on, be right back. I'm in Austin, Texas, and it's the last place you think you'd ever see a shipwreck 200 miles away from the ocean. But there is a wreck here, and it's world famous. And it's the end chapter for one of the Great Lakes' most famous explorers. Let's go take a look. This right here is the proof that most historians are looking for with the Griffin. This is a 17th century cannon. It actually has the emblem of Louis XIV on it. This would be definitive proof that they found the Griffin, not finding a bowsprit or a little nail or a piece of wood. This is what historians are looking for. I, it, very exciting to be able to see that big cannon lying there and the fact that you know we probably will be able to eventually see pieces like that. Griffin would not have a million artifacts on board. It was not going to build a fort, even though that's LaSalle's intention was to build several of them. It was only carrying those furs on its way back. So we probably wouldn't have the wealth of things that they found on there. They even found rat skeletons and uh, I mean, bullets and cannonballs. It, it's amazing to go to Austin and see it. And I hope you realize, I mean, this, this has been a story that, um, I do a lot of stuff on shipwrecks. The Griffin has just kind of been pieced together and through all the trips that I've done, I've lived, literally been able to go to um, Manitoulin Island. I got to die at Hessel. I got to go to Texas um, to put all these pieces together to try to chase down, you know, not only the story of what happened, but to do, you know, really some good detail on what will likely be found as well. Uh, I have done a bunch of other stories too that you're welcome to watch uh, and listen to. Um, I spend a lot of time in the car on my trip, so the podcast has been something that's just been amazing for me. Um, for free, you can go to shipwreckpodcast.com and actually uh, listen to, I think I have 10 uh, different programs on there now. The la latest one I put up there on the, the uh, Henry Court, the Whaleback Lost at Muskegon, has actual survivors um, that, that got on there, and there's a connection from that ship, that Whaleback, to the Edmund Fitzgerald. Uh, I also did a story on the city of Bangor, which everybody believed they, we know it's at the, it was at the tip of the uh, Keweenaw Peninsula and uh, nobody really knew exactly where it was. I found a, an interview with a guy that was there in 1929, I believe. And uh, it's a great story of how they had to march through four foot of snow to, to their own rescue and finally got picked up by the, uh, the rescuers who saved some of the guys from the 1913 storm as well from um, a, a freighter that was lost up there called the Waldo. So lots of neat history that's all tied together. You can go there. You can also follow lakefury.com for any of my DVDs as well. And uh, this is probably a great place now if we could, Heather, to, to see if there's any questions and see if I can turn off my sharing on here so I can see. There we go. Like my Griffin, I, this is a rare photograph, by the way, of the Griffin in 1679 with the Edmund Fitzgerald. I I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, there wasn't one. A great rendition, and there's a lot of question on whether or not this is what it looked like. Um, La Belle was actually a kit-built ship, meaning that there's numbers to reassemble that boat. If you look really closely, you can see them when you're there. Uh, it was meant that they were going to bring it over from France and then build it and then sail it, you know, up the Mississippi and do whatever exploring they could or come back to the France, whatever they could do. Um, but they realized that it, it just wasn't worth building, you know, remotely. So they built it in France and brought it here. And that's where ultimately it was wrecked. That is really cool. It's kind of like those American craftsman homes you could order from the Sears catalog. <laughs> it really was a paint by numbers kind of a thing. Right. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, the, the craftsmanship of those shipwrights is amazing to see the pieces that they fashioned, you know, even at Le Griffin, this is, you know, they were in the middle of the woods, you know, with uh, freezing one of the most bitter cold winters ever and under the pressure of Native Americans who were threatening to attack. I can't even right. building. Well, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to click the icon that, that says raise hand and we will unmute you. While you do that, I'll tell you today, I was over at uh, Detroit Public Television and uh, talk, we're gonna have the Edmund Fitzgerald is going to air in the Detroit area first on December 1st. And they're so excited, um, not only because we can share that great story and it's the only story that includes the building video. I found some film from 1957 and 58. Um, also interviews with the crew, uh, interviews with people who uh, sailed on the ship and, and knew Mick Sorley, the captain. Yeah. And, ultimately investigators that looked into it, including Jean-Michel Cousteau, one of my favorite interviews I've ever done, a <laughs> hero of mine. That's awesome. Well, let's see, Jean has a question. Hi, Jean. Oh, uh, well, actually, this is her husband. Hmm. Oh. <laughs> Hi, her husband. This was an exceptional presentation. I really enjoyed it. Was this Thank recorded you. so that uh, I can let some friends know that uh, they, they need to see it? Yes, it has been recorded and it will be posted um, in the next few days. Check our website for the link, but I believe it'll be on our YouTube page. Great. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. I appreciate you tuning in. And now let's see. Richard has a question. Yeah, hello. Dick Mecca here. Hi. Are, can you hear me? I can. <laughs> I can see you. You probably can't see me, though. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you anyway, Nick? After the Griffin went down in that terrible storm, LaSalle made it out of there, but that was the question. He came across Michigan somehow, didn't he? He had to walk. <laughs> well, he actually, um, because they had several canoes waiting for them when they got to Green Bay, remember he sent an advance crew that most of them split. You know, they, they went AWOL on him, but he did have enough people that did go there and gave him the furs that, that left. And then most of his party... Um, got on board the, these canoes and went down, and that's when they got stopped by that five-day storm and ended up eating a porcupine to stay uh, alive. They said porcupine with squash was their meal for the night, which if you know <laughs> porcupines are very slow, it's easier to catch. So, um, <laughs> can't yeah, did, he, did he come across Michigan then uh, with the canoes or walking somehow? No, he, he sailed down because it was in Green Bay, Wisconsin. They actually went down the river system, and they had a route to go down the Wisconsin River and go into – um, into the Mississippi eventually and then go all the way down. So they didn't come back to Michigan um, that I know about. In fact, he would have gone all the way down to the Gulf and then, yeah, I, I'm not, I think he did eventually have to make the, the voyage back up, but that would have been, you know, a year or so later after the 1679 um, expedition to go Got down. Well, thank you very much. My pleasure. Great talking to you. Same here. And here's Mick. Yes. Hi, Rick. Hi, good to see you. I guess I don't see you. <laughs> what, what, I, I wish I had a question, but it was just a fantastic presentation. Much appreciated. Uh, check out some of your Fitzgerald stuff in the last couple of days. Beautifully done. Uh, you know, the, the, I guess the thing I appreciate most about you, um, you know, everybody's fascinated about shipwrecks. They're, uh, they're, uh, uh, their boats preserved from back long before we've ever lived. But you always keep the people in mind. I think that's fantastic. Uh, can't, we can't ever forget that these are people died doing this stuff and I, I think you have great respect to that and uh, it's great to see you again man always Mick I appreciate it sir and I'll, I'll tell you for me I mean sometimes I can't think all about the crew because quite honestly that's a reality of shipwrecks and that's the fact that um, people die and if I spent a lot of time um, dwelling on the fact that these are all grave sites, I don't think I'd ever get any work done. For me, the big part of these stories has always been the rescues or the twists that happen in there. Sure. I don't go to a lot of bell ringings. Like, like Fitzgerald has an amazing one that they do every year at the Whitefish Point where I'm a board member up there. Um, I just don't go to those because they're, 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 it's so sad and it's more reverent. It's more for the family members, really. Um, and I know I'm, I'm not, you know, a fool to think that um, some family members, especially the Fitzgerald, are upset that we did dives on there as well. So I never want to be, you know, that guy there. But I do hope that out of 30 programs I've done now on PBS, 
Um, and all two books, I've, I've got a brand new book coming out now called Bottled Goodbyes. That's how I spent my pandemic um, being laid off. I thought, what am I going to do? I went through hundreds and hundreds of newspapers on several different sources online and searched all of the most famous of the uh, bottled messages stories, uh, starting with Christopher Columbus and going all the way through to the Titanic. And then eventually, of course, the Great Lakes where um, there was three different bottles found from the Christmas tree ship. So it's a 200 page book. Today, I sent it to the printer and on PBS, I plugged it. Um, we'll hopefully have it for sale after Christmas. I don't think I'm gonna make Christmas, but uh, be watching for that too. Bottle goodbyes will be the new the new product and I'm so excited sure, about it. Sure will, L looking forward to it. Take care, right? Good hearing you. All right, we'll see you. All right. And a question from Thomas. Thanks, Rick, for a great presentation. Thank you, sir. Um, it's a little bit of a research type question. Uh, for the Edmund Fitzgerald, uh, did you visit the Great Lakes Museum in Toledo, Ohio, or the uh, archives for the Great Lakes at Bowling Green State University? Both fantastic resources. And I'll be honest with you, that's usually where most, most you know, the, the smarter researchers will start. I was lucky to find a lot of my stuff at, at libraries that aren't even maritime. So, you know, things that were just labeled incorrectly, but I kind of had a hint of what they were. But Bowling Green has been a fantastic research for a uh, place for me all the time. Milwaukee Public Library is another. And I'll be honest, for a lot of this stuff, there's a lot of historians, like for the Griffin, uh, Brendan Baylod is one of the, the prem, uh, premier historians on this. He's got all the books. He's, he knows so much more, more than I'll ever know. He's forgotten, quite honestly. So there are people that um, there's better sources out there, certainly for a lot of this. I just love the stories. I love the twists that are in there. And uh, I just love to share them with audiences. And as long as people keep showing up, I'll keep telling them. Okay, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thanks for the tips too. Those are great places. Um, and here is Ken. Hey, Ken. Hey, Ken, we can't hear you, so check if your microphone. You should have received a pop up that says we've allowed you to speak. <laughs> There we go. Hey, Rick, uh, thank, thank you. Like, can you hear me? I sure can. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, a little background for me. I was part of the University of Michigan uh, archaeological field crew that worked on Summer Island in 1967. Uh, and yes, there were trade goods. The problem was, I mean, once they're traded to an area, you, know, you have diffusion and one cultural group could trade to another cultural group. So we could never say that, you know, that was the harbor. But uh, we spent uh, two months there on the island, uh, part of the summer science camp program as well. Uh, wonderful experience. I've always been intrigued by LaSalle and the Griffin. Jatel's uh, diary, uh, uh, you know, following LaSalle on his uh, a fateful trip back to Montreal, where he doesn't make is a wonderful read. Uh, if memory serves, uh, two of Lachelle's ships there weren't lost. They actually mutinied and went back to France. And then one was lost, and then uh, LaBelle, like you said, was uh, uh, sunk and then re recovered Matagora Bay. Uh, wonderful, wonderful story. Love what you're doing. Keep the story alive. We got to find it. <laughs> I know. I know. And your big summer, as you know, I mean, there's a bunch of shipwrecks there. If you look at a, a, a sky view on Google Earth, the whole end of it um, has where they were trying to build up, I guess, their own artificial harbor. And there's at least three wrecks piled up on there that you can see. Yes. Showing, uh, the yeah. Set. yeah. Yeah, and don't forget to buy uh, some good fresh food from uh, fish from uh, Peterson's Fish Market there at Fairport. Uh, uh, of course, you know the people in Wisconsin claim it's not Summer Island; it's Washington Island. There's a political fight between the two states as to where that. Well, I'll I'll, I'll shut up now and take somebody else. But have a good. Thank you so much.
Thank you. Loved it. Loved it. Thank you so much, sir. And thank you for your insight. It, it means a lot to me. Many times people in the audience know so much more and put me onto new ideas. And that's thrilling to me. It's all a learning thing for me. And, and the cha final chapter on any of these shipwrecks, what 10,000 in the Great Lakes, has, has not been written. There's always another story that's out there. And, and I'm thrilled to be able to talk to people who've had boots on the ground to be actually doing some digging and, and learning more about this amazing culture that you know, predates even Europeans that were here to Native Americans. It's amazing. Okay, and uh, here's Mary. Hi, Rick. I just want to thank you, and I really want to thank the Monroe Museum for taking on this format. I've gone to tons of these programs over this COVID period, and I was so excited to see that Monroe, where I live, is taking us on. So. Thank you for doing this. Oh, I'm, it was just a great program. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Mary. And I'll tell you, you know, nobody has suffered. I mean, everybody's felt the pinch and the pain. Um, we've even had sickness in my family. Um, but the museums, uh, there's stories now that up to a third of them could close. I've always made a call. And I think people who've seen me in Monroe before know my, my affinity for museums and libraries we have got to protect our resources. So when those doors open up and we can safely go to them again, uh, and when we can't, we can do these programs here, but museums have got to have our love. They've got to have our money. And I, I, I pray that everybody makes sure that they make an investment in these resources, not just for me, because I can't tell my stories if I don't have the local museums to help. They're the repositories of all this amazing information. So I need them, but for you too, this is your heritage. You need to protect this Monroe Museum. Um, and, and everybody's in a pinch right now. Just to think of how many museum ships we've lost, um, it's, it's sad. There's been at least four that have disappeared even in Canada. So um, it, it's a resource that we really need to protect. Absolutely. Thanks.